question. Thanks for doing that. I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. Um, welcome to the Benavia Educational Workshop Series. Uh, I am your host, Jay Lickus. I'm the guy waving here. Um, I'm the Director of Marketing over at Benavia. And today, our topic is choosing the right care. So when living alone is no longer an option due to dementia or physical challenges, Thank you. finding support for your loved ones can seem an impossible task. Um, what are the in-home care options available to you? And to maintain a purposeful life, no matter where you call home, whether it's yourself or a loved one. So I would like to welcome our CARES expert partner, Mr. Presley Reeder, the owner of Comfort Care Home Care, and he will educate us on this uh, terrific topic. If I could be so bold, Mr. Presley, can you kind of give our audience a, uh, a few minute background about yourself and how you came to the senior care industry, maybe how you became an expert and a uh, little bit about what you're gonna talk about today. Absolutely. Can you hear me all right, Jay? Sounds good. Got okay. Thumbs up from everybody. Thumbs up. All, right. all around. There we go. All right. Well, well. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I always uh, enjoy doing some education out in the community, and primarily, I hope to answer your questions today. So I'm going to try and get through this presentation part uh, quickly but clearly, and then I know you'll have some questions, and I want to make sure. There's plenty of time for me to, to answer those. Um, a little bit about my background, you can read there in the introduction. I started Comfort Care 10 years ago in June of this year, it'll be 10 years. And so I've been in hundreds of living rooms and uh, senior living communities and group homes and other uh, scenarios where I've been in conversation with families. We've, we've served set over 750 families uh, during that time with uh, in-home care. And in addition to that, I've uh, spoken on behalf of Benavia, the Alzheimer's Association, and other community groups. Possibly the most fun thing I've done has been hosting a, a radio show for over four years called Aging in Arizona. Uh, and on that, we had on professionals from all across the industry and even across the country uh, about a variety of topics. So I learned a lot interviewing doctors and directors of programs and researchers about the aging process. So that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, and now... I, uh, I get the opportunity to, to still continue to do a number of those things, although I'm not doing the radio show anymore. Um, let's see. I should probably go ahead and take the opportunity to also... Uh, Jay, can you hear an echo? Maybe you got... I just picked up an echo from you. That's from me. And I've got an echo as well. Maybe somebody's not muted. Maybe somebody's not muted. I've got everybody muted. I've got everybody muted. Uh, okay. No, no. Mary, okay. are you muted, Mary? No, no. Mary, okay. are you muted, Mary? There we go. How's that? Very good. Okay, all right. That echoes, that echo was tough, but not potentially as tough as my dog, Lucy. So I wanna go ahead and introduce Lucy. Since uh, Jay and I are doing this remotely, I'm at my house and uh, she's a great, great one-year-old border collie, but she may have something to say. And if she does, I wanted you to know her name. Okay, uh, with that, I think that's probably all you need to know about me. If you read the, the little bio there, um, I, uh, you know, you, you learned a couple of other things, but you're not here primarily for me. You're here to learn about, uh, about home care. So let's move on to uh, why home care exists. And uh, the primary reason it exists is because there's a need 
and a desire out there for caregiving uh, in the home. And the goal is to help people stay in their home as long as possible. You can see the statistics here. Home is not only the preferred place, it's often the healthiest place if you're not in an acute care situation like a hospital, uh, people tend to uh, just stay healthier in their home environment uh, if they can receive the care there. And it's obviously what most everybody prefers. Now, when I say home, we're talking about uh, a home you may have lived in for 30, 40 years. That's a you know, three bedroom, two bath type of a, a home. It's maybe a, an apartment. Uh, that's in a, you know, you got a com multi-generational community of, of apartment buildings, or it, it could be a senior living community that's considered independent living, where you aren't in assisted living and you don't have caregivers running around and, and medication folks running around, but you do have uh, maybe a need for care to come to your apartment. So when I say home, it's really wherever you call home is where caregivers can come to. And that's where people prefer to stay. Uh, Non-medical home care is what I like to say is it's customized mobile assisted living. So a lot of you are familiar with assisted living where you move into a building or a, a complex of some kind and then the staff comes there on site uh, and is there around the clock to meet your needs. Um, I think of this as, as customized, uh, number one, because uh, you're going to create the plan of care that you want to receive from the caregiver, either yourself or your loved one in the home. So um, it's going to be customized schedule, customized plan of care, customized care delivery in your environment. And you, you get a little bit of that if you move into assisted living, but generally assisted living, they're gonna put you into a template and you're gonna receive the care that, you, that everybody that's on that program receives. So home care is gonna be a little more customized to your, to your needs and obviously it's mobile. It's gonna to come to you in your home. Uh, it's also one-on-one -on -one care. So uh, again, contrast to some other settings, you're not going to have one caregiver who's taking care of multiple people, either in the, like in a hospital they would be or in an assisted living setting. You've got one caregiver who comes to your home, stays with you for however long you've agreed upon and meets your needs or your loved one's needs while they're there. They don't have any other responsibilities outside of providing the care that, uh, that you are scheduled to receive, okay? So one-on-one -on -one care. Now it's uh, delivered hourly. So um, the caregiver is gonna come out and they have a shift, an hour, a chunk of hours that they're gonna be there and uh, they're gonna stay for two hours, three hours, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. Uh, if it gets beyond what one caregiver can do, then you're gonna have a staff of caregivers who are gonna come in on shifts to meet the need, okay? So, but it's delivered and paid for, which we'll get to the payments and the costs uh, here in a little bit, but it's paid for on an hourly basis, all right? There's really two core types of care, uh, companionship and personal care. Really companionship is hands-off, and personal care is hands-on, all right? So that can be a whole range of things. And some of the follow-up materials that Jay's gonna send out, we have a list of what caregivers can and cannot do, but what they can do includes the things I've listed here on this uh, sheet. Uh, as you can see, some of those are hands-on, some of them uh, are hands-off, but either way, uh, those are services that the caregiver can provide while they're there. Really best to just think of them as a, uh, you know, personal aid in your home during the time that they're there. And there's uh, an, 
quite a few things they can do. And if you have questions about specific things, then uh, we can talk about that when the Q&A time comes up. So most often I would say we get requests for uh, help with dementia. So somebody who is starting to have a hard time remembering things or their, uh, their personal caregiver, their family caregiver is starting to have a hard time keeping up with their needs and they need a little break. So we send a caregiver in for a few days a week uh, to give that family caregiver a break. We also get these requests because somebody's maybe having calls regularly. And so maybe in the morning when they're getting up and they're getting dressed or they're showering, it's helpful to have someone from our team there to assist them to make sure that there's no, not a fall during that period of time or at night, make sure there's not a fall uh, because I'm sure you've gone to Benavia presentations about falls. Falls are not a good thing for anyone at any age, but especially when you get past 65, uh, falls can lead to a lot, a lot of bad scenarios. So a lot of times we get called in to help with that bathing and dressing and fall prevention. Um, and, uh, and that's where the relationship starts with in-home care. All right, I wanna make sure I do touch on what caregiving is not, what home care is not, because a lot of times people get it confused with home health care and hospice. So let me talk about home health care briefly. And you may again have had a chance to attend a Benavia presentation about, uh, about home health care, but I will uh, try to differentiate the two for you. Uh, home health care, as you can see in this picture, is going to be more nursing level care. So these are folks who have um, wounds that need to be attended to by a nurse. They have physical therapy that needs to be done following a surgery. They may have medications that need to physically be administered to them. So um, uh, they have a nurse coming in to administer those medications. This is most typical following a hospitalization where Medicare is going to actually pay for you to receive this type of care. And the person's going to come probably two to five times a week, depending on your needs. They're going to come, they're going to be in the house for an hour or so, maybe less. And they're going to provide that specific care related to the wound the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, et cetera. Um, after about 30 days, sometimes longer, but most common is 30 days, they're no longer going to come to the home because Medicare is going to stop paying for it. And hopefully you've gotten better and don't need that care anymore. That is not what we do. Uh, we are often there at the same time, but we're there longer periods. Uh, this person, say this nurse is coming in to take care of your wound, but then when he or she leaves, you still need help getting up out of your chair, getting uh, a meal prepared, getting your bath done, getting dressed, undressed, into bed, out of bed. That's where caregiving or non-medical home care steps in to be uh, that additional support. So it's not home health care. The other unfortunate part of that is uh, the payment piece, which is uh, you that is not covered by Medicare, our services, because they're different than what you're going to receive in home health care. So again, we'll, we'll go through all the payment stuff uh, here in a few minutes, but I want to make sure you understand the difference uh, between those two. Okay, so hospice. Now, I'm 100% sure that Benavia has done hospice presentations. Hospice is an absolutely vital service. And I highly recommend that if you have not educated yourself or your loved ones about hospice, that you do so. It is underutilized um, and uh, needs to, in my opinion, be, be used much more often by families to, uh, to get that end of life care that hospice is, is so valuable in providing. It's not home care, uh, but we 
work even more often with hospice than we do with home health care, because hospice, similarly to home health care, is not going to be there for long periods of time. They're really there to be the medical oversight. So they're going to make sure the medications are appropriate, that the individual is not in any pain, uh, that uh, they are getting uh, their bed, uh, bed baths or wounds taken care of, um, but they're not going to be there to prepare meals or to help the person transfer, as I mentioned with home health, get in and out of their bed or their chair. Uh, move around. You know, hospice doesn't necessarily mean that you're just laying in bed all day. Uh, you're still living your life. Uh, you're you're just um, you've just decided to take advantage of these hospice services. So we have caregivers that are with hospice clients anywhere from four hours a day up to 24 hours a day at the same time that the hospice team is there. So we work regularly with hospice, and our caregivers are trained to understand what the needs are for hospice uh, patients and their families. And we often are communicating with those hospice teams to make sure that uh, the individual is getting the best care from both ourselves and, and from hospice. Uh, so again, hospice is covered completely by Medicare, a fantastic service and one that we uh, really enjoy partnering with. Uh, it's just such a meaningful, uh, meaningful service. Our caregivers uh, really love being able to provide care to, to hospice patients. I'm going to have a little drink of tea here. And, uh, and then we'll continue. <clears throat> I hope you're taking notes or just jotting down questions. I'm certainly halfway through, if not more, and wanting to get to you get to those questions so you can ask them and, and we can take time answering them. Okay, let's see. I've got to click. There's, there's a lot of management, isn't there, Jay? Of the, You always make it look so smooth, my friend, but there's a lot of clicking and management on the screen sharing and whatnot. You always have to hope that the technology is cooperating as well. We, we have had to become Zoom professionals, haven't we? Bizarre okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of folks ask me this question when I'm out talking and in the community or meeting with them in their living room and they say, when, when is it really time for us to do this? Well, with education, it's always time. I say, you need, to, you need to know what services are out there. But as far as deciding when you might want to bring a caregiver into the home, the, the best advice I can give is when the days start to get really hard for either you or your loved one, it's probably a good opportunity to at least try home care. And I'll kind of put a parenthesis around that and say, one of the nice things about home care is that you can try it out. There's no long-term commitment involved. Uh, say, you know, you, you're thinking about moving to a, a community, an assisted living community. That's, that's fine. And that's a great situation for some folks. But a lot of times, you're not given an opportunity to try that. You have to move all your stuff, go through a pretty big process to even try feeling what it's like to be in assisted living. Whereas with home care, you could call us up and say, I'd like to have a caregiver come out for four hours next Wednesday from 8 a.m. to noon, and uh, that's it. You could try that. Our caregiver could come out, and then you could decide, wow, that was fantastic. We'd really like to set up a regular schedule on Wednesdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or you could say, you know what, uh, that's, I'm not comfortable with that, or we didn't have a good experience. Or we're just not ready. We'll call you back in six months, and uh, that's fine. You pay for the four hours, and <clears throat> you don't have to take any other steps at that point. So I encourage folks to do that. When the days get really hard for you or for your loved one that you're caring for, give home care a try. See if it takes the load off uh, a little bit. A lot of times family members are pitching in or neighbors are pitching in and they're starting to come more regularly and we'll get a call from one of them saying, boy, this is really beyond what I can do at this point. Um, can your caregivers come in for some of the time that I would normally be, be providing care? And, uh, and that's 
that's what we do. So, you know, hard is different for different people. Some people just power through and provide that care to their loved one all the way, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But uh, as you can see from those statistics at the bottom of the screen, it doesn't always um, benefit them mentally or physically to do that. And it doesn't always benefit their loved one either. Uh, so if it's becoming hard and that's up to your, you know, your discretion, then it's a good time to give a home care agency a call and, and uh, see about bringing somebody in. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, takes two clicks. There we go. Who are these caregivers? Well, it's really a wide range of, of caregivers. You know, in 10 years, you know, I've had hundreds of staff over those 10 years, and uh, they, they come from all backgrounds, all ages, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different socioeconomic statuses. Probably the most consistent thing is that they're female. That's just a trend in the industry. You get mostly females doing this type of work. Uh, we've had retired nurses. We've had folks who are new to caregiving and need additional training or can only handle certain types of clients. We've had 19 year olds and we've had 78 year olds. <clears throat> um, we've had folks from a whole range of cultures and countries of uh, their background. And uh, we've had folks who are independently wealthy that just really love taking care of other people. And then we've had people for whom this is their sole income and they are trying to get by uh, as a single mom with, with three kids on this, uh, on this income. So <clears throat> I can tell you a whole, whole variety of stories. Now, Everybody has to have the right kind of training to go in and provide this care. And that can vary from client to client. You know, a client who has Alzheimer's disease and is bed bound is going to require a different, different level of training and experience from their caregiver than somebody who has uh, just had hip surgery or knee surgery, but is completely alert and just needs help getting up and moving around for six weeks until they get their strength back. So, you know, we absolutely ensure that our caregivers have the right kind of training for whichever client they're assigned to. Uh, but it, it can be uh, a range uh, when it comes to that, that training and experience. A lot of our caregivers are certified nursing assistants, a CNA. That's somebody that you'd run into in the hospital providing some help to you. Uh, a lot of them are certified caregivers in the state of Arizona. That's a different license that they can go out and pursue. Some of them don't have either of those, but have cared for loved ones and family members for decades and are highly skilled in, in providing the kind of care that we, we provide. So that's, that's where it comes down to ensuring that you're working with an agency that knows its team and that gets to know you as a client and matches you up with the right kind of trained uh, caregiver and the right kind of personality, which is a big part of the matchmaking process, uh, which we'll talk, I'll mention a little bit more. So that gives you an idea on the caregivers. Uh, at Comfort Care, we have a 10 step hiring process that we take them through. They have to do all these things on the screen in order to become a caregiver for us. Um, and there are a lot of good agencies out there that do make sure folks are going through all these steps, that they're getting their background checks, that they are um, uh, getting drug tested and making sure they're demonstrating an ability to provide the kind of care that we expect them to be able to provide. Um, with that, I will say that in Arizona, you do have to be careful. Um, and I don't wanna, you know, scare anybody with this, but Arizona is what's called a non-licensed state, which means that the uh, Health and Human Services Agency in the state of Arizona has decided not to regulate in-home care like the kind we provide. When it's not regulated, which is the case in over 20 states, uh, that means 
the state does not want to get involved in checking my caregivers out, making sure I'm keeping appropriate records, making sure I'm drug testing and background checking everybody. The state is not involved in that. Uh, what that also means is that anybody can print a flyer, hire their neighbor, hire their daughter, and call themselves a caregiving agency. And if you as a customer don't ask the right questions, then you won't be able to distinguish between somebody like that and somebody like me who has employees that are on W-2, who carries workers' compensation insurance and general liability insurance, um, who pays all the taxes, including social security, unemployment, um, and who most, most importantly oversees and manages the caregivers. Um, without getting into all the ins and outs of running a business, if you're just somebody who pays your neighbor to go out and be a caregiver, uh, you know, that's not, that, that relationship doesn't, isn't allowed by the IRS to be an oversight and management relationship. It's a 1099 where that person can do whatever they want and they're not covered by insurance in case something happens either to them as a caregiver or they were to get injured, there's no insurance for that, or to you as a client, if something were to happen, you have no recourse uh, against them other than civil, uh, which will be very challenging if something were to come up like that. So I just say that to make sure you know what decision you're making when you're talking to in-home care agencies. Are you bringing in an agency that uh, is doing all these things, or are you just bringing in an individual to, to provide the care? And as long as you know that and you're making the decision, that's completely up to you, okay? So uh, they're called private caregivers, non-agency caregivers. Okay, fun part now, everybody loves to talk about the cost of things. Uh, it's fairly easy to uh, do the math on home care because as I said, it's hourly. So it really comes down to, okay, how many hours a week? How many hours a month am I going to be getting this care? And then multiplying the hours by the rate that you're being charged by the agency. Um, I've done a little bit of math for you here just to give you some examples. <clears throat> and I will say in-home care is gonna be your most expensive option over time if you get up to large hours because it's one-on-one. -on -one. So you're hiring somebody to work with you individually to come into your home. And so it can get very expensive once you're requiring, you know, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, that type of thing. On average, I tried to put kind of a typical scenario in here or an average scenario. You're going to be looking at that 20 hours a week. You know, we've got a lot of families or uh, couples who will bring a caregiver in for four hours a day, five days a week during the weekdays so that one of the family members uh, can go out, stay active, do the other things that need to be done for the house <clears throat> and have the support there from the caregiver five days a week, four hours a day. So that's 20 hours a week that's gonna be $2,500 a month, all right? Obviously, if you go to 40 hours a week, it doubles. If you go to 80 hours a week, it doubles again, okay? So uh, you can use this when Jay sends it out and you know. Right now, the rate for, uh, for agencies I'm finding out there is 30 to $40 an hour. Um, that can vary, but you have to talk to each agency to find that out. Uh, we're in that range, 32 up to 38, depending on how many hours, depending on uh, location. Some folks will call us from Goodyear. I've had calls from Yuma. <laughs> you know, that costs more uh, because of the travel that it takes uh, for the caregivers to get there and, and those types of factors. But I think a good safe amount, probably if you're if you're looking at doing the budgeting, would be to do something in that thirty to thirty-five dollars an hour if you're in the Sun City West area, Surprise area. Okay, 
And then non-agency, back to that previous slide where I was talking about caregivers who do not work for an agency like mine, um, they don't have the insurance costs, they don't have the tax expenses, they don't have office or office staff to coordinate the schedule, um, backup caregivers who are on call in case of an emergency, so those additional costs, so they can charge less. So you can probably get yourself a caregiver from uh, Craigslist or your church or something for 15 to $20 an hour uh, if you decide to go that route, knowing the risks that you're taking. So that's gonna be cheaper uh, from just a cost perspective. Okay, how to pay. I've already given you the bad news on that. Medicare does not pay for this. I get calls every week swearing up and down to me that Medicare does pay for this. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't. They are looking at it. There are some unique programs out there now that are starting to, I mean, just at the beginning, looking at, at paying for a very small amount of this type of care. If I had to make a prediction, I'd say in the next 10 years, Medicare may take on more of this expense because there's a demand. But right now, I wouldn't factor in uh, that to your consideration of home care. Uh, it's just not, even if you can find a few dollars to pay, it's not gonna be significant and uh, not gonna meet your need when it comes to in-home care. Uh, Medicaid, on the other hand, will pay and they will pay a significant amount towards your, uh, your in-home care needs. Now, of course, with Medicaid, you have to qualify financially and medically, and you are working with the state. So you're going to be having to provide reports, making sure they're gonna, they're gonna come out and assess your needs. They're gonna tell you, you qualify for this number of hours, this many hours a week. You're gonna have less flexibility on when, when the caregivers come and which caregivers you get. Um, a lot of times folks have run into situations where caregivers don't speak English and uh, they're having a hard time you know, navigating that, but you don't have as much choice because you're not, technically you're not paying for it, right? The state is paying for it. And so you're gonna run into some of those challenges, but for a lot of people, it's a real godsend to have that care through Medicaid. And uh, it's called Altex. I'm sure again, Benavia has either had or is one upcoming to talk about the Altex program and what you can qualify for through Altex the Arizona long-term care system, but that's Medicaid and you can get some in-home care like we offer through Medicaid. Also very similarly to Medicaid, VA benefits, uh, you have to qualify medically and financially and in other ways with the VA. It's a good program to look into if you're a veteran or a surviving spouse. I'm not gonna go into all the ins and outs, but you can get some payment for that. And that one is more like a pension. They'll pay you the money and then you pay me for the services. So <clears throat> that's something to look into if you are uh, a veteran. Long-term care insurance. You would already have this. You'd be paying for it privately. So monthly uh, premiums for the past, usually 15, 20 years, <clears throat> maybe you bought it. And uh, long-term care insurance often does cover in-home care. We work with probably 30% 25 to 30% of our, um, yeah, I have it there, 25% of our clients use long-term care insurance to pay for at least a portion of their services. So if you bought a policy like that, I'm happy to look at it and tell you what you'd qualify for. I've seen hundreds of them, um, no charge. I can just explain it to you. And uh, it's a good one to know about. Definitely want to take advantage because you've paid for it over the years. But 75% of our clients in that last bullet point do pay out of pocket. So this is a time when people are digging into their savings. Uh, they're digging into the money that they've kept for such a time as this, and they're paying uh, out of pocket. We bill bi-weekly, pay by credit card, you can pay out of your checking account, et cetera. But uh, most of our clients are paying a, a large portion of their expenses out of pocket, okay? Again, I'm happy to take questions at the end about how you pay for all this or what you're paying for. <clears throat> okay, I thought I'd hit on a, a few more of these uh, FAQs real quick. 
I get a lot of these questions and, and maybe that'll be one of the ones you've written down. Uh, how does scheduling work? Again, that's customized. We have a four hour shift minimum. Most agencies have a minimum shift, meaning that every time the caregiver comes to your house, they have to stay for a certain amount of time. The reason for that is the caregivers are looking for work. They're not gonna wanna come out for 30 minutes or an hour. They are, if they're gonna come, they're gonna stay for a minimum period of time. And in our case, it's four hours. Agencies are kind of across the board on that. Some are less, some are more, but you need to reach out and find out. Uh, that can, like I said earlier, be once a week, several times a week, all the way up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have overnight care. We have care that lasts for one week and then stops because somebody went on a trip. You know, so there's just this whole range of how scheduling works. We typically schedule 10 to 14 days out. So if you call me now and you say, hey, we're going to need care in six months, I'm going to say that's fantastic. I'd love to come meet with you in five months, get to know you, understand the need. And then I'm going to call you two weeks after that. And we're going to actually tell you who your caregiver is going to be about 10 to 14 days in advance of the actual care starting. We do sometimes, you know, people call us and say, I need a caregiver tomorrow. Can you help us out? Of course, we're going to do everything we can to, to make that work. Uh, if we can get caregivers who are available and get them out there to you on short notice. Uh, is there a contract? With us, there is no contract. I don't think there should be a contract. So if you're talking to someone else, you want to find out if they are making you sign up for three months of care. And if you cancel after a week, they're still going to charge you. You want to be real careful about that. I've heard some horror stories, but in our case, no, it's not a contract. You, as I said earlier, can cancel with 24 hour notice. Um, you do have to sign something with us that covers, you know, liability and the kind of 101s of us working with you, but it's not uh, a contract for a term of service. We match caregivers by getting to know you, coming out and doing a, an hour and a half or so assessment in your home, getting to know you and your loved one. What's your personality? <clears throat> what are the needs, as I talked about earlier, when it comes to care? And then we're doing our best to then look at our team and put that puzzle together, all right? A lot of times we get it right on the first try, Sometimes we don't, and folks call us and say, this person is just not a good fit. They're doing the right kind of work here, but they talk too much, or some other personality issue comes up that is, is not a good fit. If that's the case, uh, we're going to work with you to bring another caregiver in until we find that right balance. And I tell folks, look, that's probably going to take a couple of weeks, not three weeks or four weeks to make sure we've got the right individual or team in place for you and your loved one. Are they screened? I kind of touched on this with our background. Yes, they are. If they steal something, we have insurance for that. We've not had that happen, thankfully, in 10 years. Uh, we've been accused of, of stealing things a number of times, particularly by folks who are starting to uh, have a little bit of dementia but thank goodness we've always been able to find those items and uh, we've not had anybody disappear. That is, again, going back to the private caregivers, a risk if you bring somebody else in, if they walk off with it, you don't have any recourse. Uh, how do I choose the right agency? I think, you know, getting to know the uh, oversight team is as important, if not more important than getting to know the caregiver. A lot of times people want to interview the caregiver. Well, we've got more than 50 caregivers on our team. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to trust that we know them and we're going to get the right person with you. If not the first time, then the second or third time we try somebody. Um, I really encourage you to sit down with somebody from the office. If you can't get in touch with the owner, make sure it's a care manager or director of some kind and make and, and get to know that person ask them these questions, uh, build some trust with them. You know, this is not, I tell families when I'm sitting with them, I'm not, I'm not selling you a pen and it's a question of whether or not you like the green color and pen works or not. This is a, a relationship and you, you need to build trust 
to the point where you know I'm going to send somebody safe into your home, that somebody that's been screened, and that you know me and my team in the office is going to we're going to do everything we possibly can to ensure that you're happy with the care that you're receiving. So I'd interview a few agencies. Um, as long as you're not in a, a huge rush, then you should have time to do that. Even if you're not, I'd sit down with at least two uh, and, and look them in the eye and see how you feel once you've talked to them. All right, wrapping up here, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to just give you a few more things to think about before your questions. First, uh, money really matters a lot. And I know that's not a surprise to you, but knowing what your financial situation is as you make decisions about senior living and uh, staying at home uh, is important. You know, we, we just had a client for the last three and a half years who was a wonderful client who had care in their home 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right up until the very moment that they passed away. Uh, our caregivers were there around the clock with this individual and their family, for whatever reason, had sufficient funds to pay for that care for almost for three and a half years and uh, no questions asked. Now, obviously that's not the situation for a lot of folks. The other end of the spectrum, if you're in a position financially where you think you might qualify for Medicaid, you need to look into that and get prepared to make that decision. If you're somewhere in the middle of those two, but your goal is to stay at home, uh, you really need to, as I said, look at that long-term care insurance policy. Look at your finances. How much do you come in? How much do you have coming in every month? How much do you have going out? How much home care can you afford? Can you afford that 20 hours a week? Can you afford 40 hours a week? And really do some of that math so that you know where your break point is, you might need to go to a setting where it's not one-on-one -on -one care, it's a group home or an assisted living facility where you can, you can pay the monthly fee and you can uh, get all those services wrapped together, but you're no longer in your home. So really spending a lot of time understanding that and looking at that is important and to do that before you're in the crisis. What's your situation with community, family, and friends? We have a lot of clients who are able to go a long way in their home, relying on their church community, their family that's local, friends who they've built relationships with over time. We have a lot of other clients whose family is almost entirely out of state or entirely in Chicago and California. And their family's just not in a position to be down the street when they have a need. And so, they have to, uh, but they want to stay in their home. So they, they bring in home care. Uh, another one is your home environment. People want to stay in their home. Um, people who want to stay in their home need to make sure they set their home up for success and themselves up for success. Do you have grab bars installed in your shower? Is your furniture uh, equipped for you to get in and out of it when that becomes more difficult? We do an, an entire home assessment that's part of our onboarding where we make recommendations about how you can tweak your home environment to make it the kind of place that you can live in all the way up until hospice comes um, for you or your loved one. Uh, so there are some adjustments that you'll need to make in the home if it's not already set up that way. Some people have really narrow hallways, really narrow bathrooms tough to get wheelchairs in and out of there, that kind of thing. So it's good to think about. Uh, lastly, emergency scenarios. Uh, if you're in your home and you're not in a facility and you fall, how are you gonna notify uh, emergency services? Um, I always recommend that if you live alone or you leave your loved one who has dementia alone for prolonged periods of time, you should be wearing some kind of alert device that will um, notify emergency services if you were to fall or need assistance for whatever reason. Uh, they're not that expensive. You put them around your neck, you set it and forget it. And they can be a real lifesaver, um, especially avoiding laying there for a long period of time. And nobody, nobody wants to be in that situation. So I really 
think people should be utilizing the basic technology that's been around for decades. You know, I've fallen and I can't get up uh, that can, can save your life. Um, so that was the last recommendation I wanted to, to, to hit on is to, to look into that. We can help you get those set up. We can talk to you about what your options are. The watches now even have this fall detection on them. So we can talk about what your choices are. All right, those are my considerations and recommendations. And I don't, I don't have a slick thank you or ending page there, Jay, but I'm done. So uh, I am happy to answer questions. I tried to cover as much as I could, but I'm sure I missed some things. Uh, so fire away. That was fantastic. Thank you, Presley, for that. Um, I'm sure everybody has a question or two they would like to ask Presley, and this is a great time to do it. Um, make sure that you unmute yourself, or if you want to raise your hand, I can click and send you a little note that says unmute yourself. That's easy enough. Or you can add it to the chat box as well, and I will go ahead and let Presley know about those questions. So let's open up the floor and see what kind of questions we have out there on home care. And I do recommend don't be bashful. Do you ever go into independent living facilities? Great question. Uh, we absolutely do often. In fact, we are, uh, we actually have a satellite office on site at an, uh, an independent living community in Sun City right now. So uh, for those of you who don't know what independent living is, that's a senior living community but they don't, so you have your apartment, you usually have a meal plan, uh, you know, it's low maintenance. They've got housekeepers and, and uh, yard maintenance folks there. Great scenario, but that what they don't have is caregiving. And so uh, we regularly go into those types of settings to, to provide care uh, to individuals and that's their home. In, the, in their apartment, we, we come directly to the apartment you know, the, the staff at the, the community know that we're there, but we're going there just for that individual in their apartment at the independent living. So, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was a great question, Peggy. Thank you. And we go into assisted living sometimes, too, to be honest. Uh, sometimes assisted living... Um, you know, their staff get overwhelmed with the care for one of the individuals in their community. They may call us and say, the family may say, we want to bring you in to be a one-on-one -on -one caregiver for our family member because the caregivers at the assisted living are trying to care for 10 people and their loved one needs more attention on a one-to-one -one basis. So we do that as well. Um, I have a question. What about uh, assistance where uh, just uh, some cooking and light housekeeping is needed? Um, what would you advise on that? Uh, it's a great question. We get called sometimes by folks who are just looking for light housekeeping. And you know, I think the best situation for that is, um, is to just get a, a, a good house cleaning service. You know, our, our staffs are doing this because they want to provide health care. You know, they want to get in, be in the health care provision business. And so if they're coming in and all they're doing is cleaning the house, uh, really, it doesn't require four hours. And you're going to, caregivers are going to turn over because they're not going to be as satisfied in their work if they're just doing house cleaning and cooking. Uh, meals is really tough. Uh, Jay may have some suggestions for this too, but uh, you know, you look into a Meals on Wheels situation. Uh, our caregivers certainly do cook uh, and they'll do that when they're in there. But if it's all they're doing, we're probably not the right, the right fit. I'd look into some different options for meals. Excellent. Yeah, I would like to just uh, chime in a little bit on that, Presley. If you find yourself or a loved one or a neighbor that is struggling just a little bit with their independence, and maybe they're just looking for 
some sort of assisted transportation to a doctor's appointment, or maybe help grocery shopping. Well, Benavia has a free, we call them home services. So you call us, get it set up. And we have about 125 volunteers on staff right now that um, will do that for you free of charge. Um, they'll help you with your little, maybe with some of your personal um, um, daily activities like uh, bookkeeping or helping you balance your checkbook. But we're not gonna do anything that's um, very in depth. Um, we do handyman services, but nothing that involves licensing or any sort of accounting, things like that. So if it's something small and you just need that little extra help, um, you know, turn to Benavia, give us a call. If it does get into something where you need more care, then obviously that's when we turn to our expert partners like Presley and Comfort Care and make that recommendation. Thank you. Bill, and if I could just add to that, um, I wanna make sure I'm clear that our caregivers will do, will do those things. So maybe just to sketch out a, a typical four hour shift for folks, you know, our caregiver would, would show up at let's say 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. and they come in the house and uh, go help the individual get up out of bed, get dressed, get showered. Well, probably shower before they get dressed. And then, uh, you know, help them make sure they're safely to the kitchen. And then at that time, they're gonna do the meal preparation, provide the breakfast, and then take the person and get them settled, clean the kitchen, make sure they vacuum the house, maybe tidy up the bathroom, do some laundry, and then maybe there's a doctor's appointment at 11 o'clock and the caregiver takes the individual out to the doctor's appointment, they go and then they bring them back home say goodbye and the shift is over. So, you know, that's where the meal preparation and the light housekeeping do happen. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly part of our services, just to, just to be clear on, uh, on doing that. If anybody else has a question, please make sure to unmute yourself. Like I said we've got a we've got an expert here in front of us, so we should take advantage of, of his time. Well, either everybody, either I put everybody to sleep or I answered all their questions, Jay. Maybe that's one of those two things. Bob, do you have a question for Presley? Yeah, Presley, uh, you may or may not be able to answer this, and it's more of a tax question, but if you're hiring a um, non-agency person to work 20 hours a week or so, uh, aren't you running into situations where you're liable to be paying FICA and those types of things for that individual? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I didn't get into the details on that, Bob, but yes, you're an employer. Uh, and so you run into a variety of requirements that you're supposed to be following. Now, do people do that or do they just pay cash, right? That's, that's up to them, but it's, uh, you, you know, the IRS may come looking. Great question. That, that, that even happens with family members as well. You have to remember yeah. if you're paying somebody for caregiver duties, they, uh, they are, you become an employer as, as Presley says. Yeah, that's a good point. Now Medicaid, actually Jay, you can hire. So just so people know, if you are getting Medicaid services, Medicaid will pay your family member to provide mm -hmm. the care. So that's another Arizona long-term care system question. Uh, you, can, you can do it that way, but again, that's the state paying. All right. Excellent. Has anybody used in-home care and had an experience they'd be willing to share? Oh. I have. 
Is that Connie? That. Yes, it is. <laughs> Go ahead, Connie. Uh, well, the, the in-home care I had was through uh, our insurance because my husband was in the hospital for 17 days and it was more physical therapy uh, than home care. But it was wonderful and it helped him a great deal. Great. And I have That's a suggestion. I don't know, since you're giving general information, which is great information, if you can post your address and telephone number on your presentation. Hmm. Thanks for asking. Can can everybody see the, let's see, comfort care. I can put it in the chat pretty easily if everybody can see the chat. I'm not, we'll also I'm not make good a point. at self-promotion here, Jay. Uh, you were asked. I will go ahead as well if you'd like, Presley, when I send out the... Uh, follow-up email to everybody. I will have your contact information in that as well. If you have further questions, I know it was a lot of great information today. And sometimes questions don't come till, you know, a few hours or a day later, you're like, oh, should have had a V8. And you think I'd like to say something. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, well, I had some home care through an agency. And uh, I found out, you know, the, the agency gets half the money and the person that's working for you only gets a part of it, you know. And But I had bad luck with the people that they sent. A, a few were good, but sometimes they wouldn't show up that day. So then I'd be a couple, three hours without anybody. And then one lady put a plastic bag in the oven and she turned it on and she wrecked my oven. And I've had all kinds of, you know, things like that broken at the house and then you don't know who's going to come you think somebody's going to come one day and it's somebody else or maybe nobody comes or right in the middle of the shift they leave and so i had uh, i had bad luck bad luck with home care but i would like to know if you have a telephone number how can we reach medicaid if i wanted to uh, find out if i can find out if i can qualify sure i think <clears throat> for, for Medicaid, I know Jay and the team at Benavia have partners that specialize in, in that. I wouldn't recommend calling Medicaid directly. You know, I think we've all had the experience of calling government agencies directly, and that's not, not the best route to go. <laughs> I, would call, um, I would call one of the partners that, that Benavia works with. Uh, they have an elder law firm that specializes in that, that type of thing. So for as far as Medicaid, that's what my recommendation would be get that from Jay. I really, Kathy, appreciate you sharing that story about, and I was hoping somebody would share a bad story about their experience with home care because there are plenty of them out there. Um, and I'm sorry that you had to experience that. And I certainly hope it wasn't with us. Uh, I don't, no, I don't it wasn't. think it was. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's what goes back to what I said about, uh, you know, talking to the team understanding what their processes are. Uh, it really is unacceptable that a caregiver wouldn't show up. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that it's unacceptable and it needs to be dealt with and it can't be a repeating scenario. Uh, you need to be able to call the agency and if that's not fixed, then you should move on. There are dozens of agencies out there, or other agencies that are going to fix the problems for you. And I I try to be honest with family members. I say, you know, are we going to make mistakes? Are our caregivers going to make bad choices? Probably. Uh, it's the nature of the business that we're all humans and there's a lot of human interaction going on in this business. At the same time, my best commitment to you is we're not going to ignore those problems. We're going to get them fixed either by replacing the person we're talking it through another solution uh, in order to make sure it gets fixed. You're paying us way too much money to have those kinds of headaches. So uh, I guess that's, that's the best I can say is I'm sorry our industry uh, treated you that way. I hope you, know, you wouldn't have that experience with us and um, we do the best we can to try and avoid it. Uh, I don't know why she put a plastic bag in the oven. That's 
I mean, I've had caregivers do some ridiculous things. That one's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Bob, I think there is. Uh, uh, Presley, uh, have you had experience with your teams working with clients that are using fiduciaries to handle their financial yes. affairs? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Good question, Bob. We have we have had experience with fiduciaries and uh, folks who are called geriatric care managers that sometimes families hire hire privately. So uh, you may be referring to a situation where a fiduciary has been appointed by the state to handle someone's financial affairs. In that case, we're essentially a subcontractor uh, when the conservator or the fiduciary decides that care is needed, they contact us and, and we come in and, and provide the care. Is that, was there a more specific question about that or well, no, just making it, sure it works? It was more related to someone getting to the point where they're concerned about being able to handle their financials, their fi handle their finances um, and needing someone to assist in that regard. Sure. Well, fiduciaries are a great option in that case. Uh, they're overseen by the state. You know, you should be able to find somebody that's competent and trustworthy to manage those affairs. <clears throat> a lot of people just hand that responsibility over to their family member. But uh, in some cases, the fiduciary is required. And then when caregiving becomes a need, if the individual has expressed the desire to continue to stay in their home uh, and they can afford it, then the fidu fiduciary contacts us and we've done that dozens of times. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Good question. Gail, you had a question? Yeah, just quickly, uh, not so much a question, but I do have to leave now. But uh, my husband, uh, I was very interested in hearing what you had to say because my husband has Alzheimer's. I mean, he's doing well. He actually attends Lucy Ann's place uh, every day and uh, he gets great stimulation and it's wonderful. Uh, the day will come when he then my goal is to keep my husband home uh, until we go into hospice and he passes. If I don't do that first, who knows, right? But um, so I don't look to do something like this for a very long time, but when there's a decision, I would much rather keep him home than put him in a memory care facility. Um, we do have long-term long -term insurance, uh, as well as he was in Vietnam. So um, I know they cover in, you know, independent living kind of thing, but um, so what, is there an average time that, or not, or just really is individual, so individual that you actually provide this care before someone actually goes into hospice? I mean, is it a long time? Is it years or, or just, it does, it's just individual? Well, it is, it is really individual depending on the person's, you know, in your case, <clears throat> dementia can be a, a long journey, as yes. you know, right? Yes, um, yes. Depending on the person's physical health, uh, you know, that, that's obviously a big factor. So if the person has dementia, but they're healthy as a horse, otherwise, right. then the journey can be, can be long to getting to the point where you need a, a lot of care. Yes. You know, so we'll, we'll work with families for three to five years where we're really just there to, to give you, the, the family caregiver, a break a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be a gradual increase in the amount of care right. and until either the financial situation no longer allows it or right. uh, the need becomes so great. I, I would say most often with dementia, what happens is the overnights become a challenge. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of times we'll we'll stay with families who have a loved one with dementia until we're doing eight hours a day um, or 10 hours a day, four times a week, up to seven days a week. And that's still working for them. Hmm. But then when the individual gets to the point in their disease progression where they're getting up a lot at night Mm -hmm. um, or they're restless and it's causing the family caregiver to not be able to get rest at night. Right. And that's when it turns into a 24 seven care scenario. Yeah. And, and that's often when people say, I've got to put them in a memory care because I can't handle it anymore or we can't afford it anymore. You know, and and you get to the point where you don't really want somebody in your home overnight while you're sleeping. It's just kind of uncomfortable. They're awake, but does that make sense? I I don't know if that. it's yeah, a very that makes individual the, situation. Yeah. The only thing I heard you say, Gail, that I want to make sure you check on is you said that you're sure your long-term care policy covers independent living. You do want to make sure that on that, that one page that outlines your benefits that it says in home care. Okay. Okay. So okay. make sure you look at that because it has to say in home care on it. And some of them don't, a lot of them do, but some of them do not. You'd want to make sure. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I know. I can look at it for no okay. charge if you'd like me to. Okay. No problem. Yeah. My husband has yeah. better labs than I do. So, I mean, he's wonderfully, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Blessing. he doesn't have to yeah. pay high cholesterol pills like I do, you know, but uh, he doesn't, he doesn't know anything from past or present, but he's uh, still happy and wonderful. And we have a good time every day, but uh, yeah, it's a long process. It's a very it's long very life. Nice. And yet, it can turn on a dime. Uh, so we just don't know. So, right, that so it's good to be informed. To That's why I really tuned in. So it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I know you have to go. Thanks, Gail. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, Gail. Any other questions? Jay, I, Jay, I put, I'm putting contact information in the chat. I hope that's sufficient for now. That is <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know. I decide who I want to be with the most based on their virtual backgrounds. I, Deb looks cozy with the snow. I definitely don't want to be with C. Mel because they look like they're running somewhere. I don't want to do that. Um, I think the snow. Oh, Jay, now you're a musician. There you go. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope I've answered some questions. Well, I, I just want to go back to your statement earlier about, you know, the decision of whether you put people to sleep or whether you answered all the questions. And Presley, I got to say, I, I, I'm amazed. That was a tremendous amount of information. Very easy to understand. Uh, I mean, you disseminated it very um, properly for everybody to kind of catch on to it. I, I appreciate that so much. Um, I hope everybody was uh, as enthused as I was listening to that. I learned a lot today. And I just want to say, like, I uh, go back that we are recording this, and the video will be posted on our YouTube channel, as well as the presentation. I know Presley sent me a, a few other attachments, which I'll be sending out as well, uh, some highlights of things that uh, he talked about today and things that are important in your decisions on home care. So, and um, I just want to say, uh, you know, a pat on the back to Presley. And so everybody knows you kind of touch bases on some of the different behaviors of home care companies. And Presley is a, a CARES partner with Benevia. And we have, I, I think, probably 20 to 25 different senior uh, organizations or businesses we work with and, and that we um, actually promote um, to folks when they have questions, like folks like you when you come on uh, workshops like this. And all these companies are vetted. We've worked with them for a long time. There's a lot of background checks. So, um, you know, we can rest assured that the information you heard today from Presley um, was very professional and very expert. And uh, if you have any questions and you don't know where to turn, call Benavia and we will make recommendations like Presley's company uh, to you. For whatever part of the uh, you know journey you're on, as far as uh, 
uh, issues with senior health and care. So uh, again, thank you, Presley. That was tremendous. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, we do, if not one or two workshops a month at Benavia, just like this, we touch on a lot of different topics. Uh, we have upcoming some estate planning, uh, talk about shopping for senior care. We touched on independent and assisted living. Uh, we will have a, a workshop to clarify that. Uh, we'll be talking to a fiduciary here within the next 30 days. So make sure you're uh, keeping an eye on the Benavia website. And uh, we, we have updates to that at all times. We also send out emails and uh, flyers and things to that accord. So um, all our information is available on our website. We have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, we have a LinkedIn page. So if you guys are out there playing in the social media playground, you can always find Benavia's information. So again, thank you, Presley. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I know that you're, uh, you're busy and you, you know, take a lot of time to uh, join us, but we do appreciate your support of Benavia. If there's any other questions, I, I don't have any social life, so I'm here till like midnight. So if you guys have any further questions, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, raise your hand while we got Presley. Otherwise, uh, we'll call it an afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Presley. Yeah, Thank my you. pleasure, everyone. Take care. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you, Presley. Enjoy your afternoon. Have a great rest of the week, folks. Thank you for your support of Benavia. Thank you, too, to me. <clears throat>